Let me again thank the Foresight Group uh, and their partners for the kind invitation to be here. And I must say that it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you. Uh, first, because I am very interested and very invested in technology and the future of technology and what that holds for our country. And also because I know that the potential that we have is so incredible that with the right policies, with the right approach, we can actually become the world leader in digital technology and all its various ramifications. So this, every gathering such as this is important because as I'm sure for me and as I'm sure for you, this is a listening, learning and thinking event. Introspection, thinking, is what's going to get us as far as we want to go. And we are at a pivotal season in human history. And every pivotal season in human history, people don't even notice. They don't think that it's that important. But we are welcoming the third iteration of the web, the so-called Web 3.0 or Web 3. Already the changes that are and will be taking place are quite simply mind-boggling. Within three decades, we've seen some of the most astonishing transformations in the way that we work, in the way that we live, in the way that we learn, and the way that we do business. Beginning with uh, Web 1.0 or Web 1 between 1989 and 2005, Web 1 was a wonder all by itself. Although it didn't have the capacity to sift through internet pages, and most information that was on Web1 was from directories, from various, you know, hard copy directories. So as a law professor in that Web1 era, I couldn't use the web for any useful research. I had to go twice a year to the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London to do the extra research I needed. And I came back from every trip with, a tr with trunk loads of photocopies from my research. So I had to physically go to the libraries, make the photocopies. I mean, of course, there were libraries here, but the, uh, the uh, library of the Institute in, in, in London is, is probably one of the best in the world for common law research. And so I go there twice a year, bring back bales of uh, photocopies at great cost, as you can imagine, you know. And my wife always teased me that uh, people go abroad and bring back nice things, bring back nice things for themselves and for their wife, she would hint me, and I come back with uh, loads of photocopies and all that. But between, 20, between uh, 2005 and today, the Web 2 era, we have witnessed the coming into its own of the so-called social web, the revolution of the interactive internet, advanced web technologies, which enable the building of platforms like YouTube, uh, Wikipedia, and then social networks, so, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Yelp, MySpace, etc. And also the distribution and sharing of data across various platforms and a plethora of user-generated content. So the web too has, I mean, this is where we are, but one thing that we must note about the Web2 era is for someone like me, again, as a, a, a professor, I can now do research online. I can sift through internet pages, which we couldn't do in Web1, ask questions. I can actually interrogate specialized websites and visit libraries and data centers online. So I don't have to go abroad and go and bring uh, my data and all of that. I can actually do all of my research just using my iPad. I have access to an incredible amount of information, something that was impossible then. So where my productivity as a law professor was probably 10% or 20%, now it's a thousand times much more than my productivity then. But, but of much greater moment is that 
This Web 2 also has seen the explosion of e-commerce, e-banking, and then the grand age of social networks and all the implications of the social networks. And now we are in the early days of Web 3. The defining components of Web3 is what we're going to be talking about today. Blockchain technology, smart contracts, uh, decentralized finance, decentralized finance, tokens, both fungible and non-fungible, the NFTs, and the whole range of the token economy. Unlike Web2, where data is mostly centrally stored, the big advantage of Web3 is that data will be interconnected in a decentralized way and will also be machine readable. Now that's big because uh, decentralized, um, I'll come to the question of is machine readability, but decentralized protocols, as you know, is at the heart of blockchain, cryptocurrency, technology, and the whole range of DeFi. So these systems will be effectively integrated and they will be interoperable and automated through smart contracts. That data will be machine readable is very significant. That's a big deal, which is why Web3 is sometimes described as the semantic web. This means that users and, machine and, 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 and machines using AI and machine learning will be able to creatively interact with data. Before now, I mean, before this era, what we were talking about was human beings interacting with data. But now machines with their own intelligence will be able to interact with data, use data, compute, and various things by, you know, literally on their own steam. And these developments, all these developments mean a whole lot. First is the, what people describe as the sovereignty of the user, the increasing sovereignty of the user. The user will have more control over personal data. DeFi will mean cheaper and faster financial transactions as all the middlemen, middle institutions will be retired. And of course, that's happening now already. We see that uh, with DeFi's middlemen, middle institutions in financial transactions are practically eliminated. So this means more room for fintechs and not just for banking services, but also insurance and consumer finance. Even central banks, central banks all over the world, have to rethink their roles. And we've been saying this to our central bank in various ways, that, hey, look, you've got to start rethinking the role of the central bank. Blockchain will challenge the centralization of money to authority with all its imperfections. There is no question in my mind at all that the sovereignty of central banks, the way that central banks operate, centralized money to authority, it's, 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 it's days are clearly numbered. It's either the central banking systems all over the world would ab adopt blockchain technology or they'll be taken over by blockchain, uh, blockchain technology. We are certainly, in my own view, in the last days of central banking, the central banking system as we know it, which means the space is open for all sorts of innovation uh, in, in the central banking space. From a policy perspective here in Nigeria, we need to again expand the range of banking licenses that are available to enable more players in that whole financial mediation value chain. We must also set clear rules to enable crypto markets and trading in other digital assets. So, the, so, so, so for, for policy, it's evident that you can't use the same old banking licenses that we used to have. And I'm sure many would have noticed that in the past, there was only one type of banking license. This was a banking license that cost 25 billion. So if you wanted to establish a bank, you need to have 25 billion Naira. But in the past few years, and this is excellent policy changes that took place, but a lot of pressure from young men and women in the tech and entertainment space. The central bank has now modified, and there are several different types of banking licenses which is why you have the fintechs that you have, the unicorns that you have, because they are using a different cadres of central bank licenses of, uh, that do not require a 25 billion Naira um, the share capital. So, so for example, Kuda Bank and several of these other uh, banks, obviously 
have a different type of license. Even the flutter waves, the base bags have a different type of license, although they are in some form of banking or the other. So now with the new iterations with Web3, we're going to have to rethink that and then create other types of licenses that are even much, much, much cheaper so that more and more participants can come into that space and be able to do useful work. One of the things that we've got to do is to change uh, the regulatory atmosphere because you can't have a situation where you're insisting that people must bring large sums of money to be able to obtain licenses. Already, there are people doing all sorts of work, you know, and today, the way you're going to have to regulate is look more at taxes. Even that whole tax space is another big opportunity for digital technology uh, and, and people who are going to be involved in digital technology. How do you really tax some of these digital companies? You know, there's, there's a lot of talk going on all over the world, there's lots of ideas, arguments, and all of that. But uh, today is not uh, a day for all of that. Now, identity in the Web3 age is a key development. It means that the user owning his own or her own identity and personal data, that's what it means. That In this Web3 age, identity is critical. So the user is the owner of his own personal data, unlike what we saw all along up until now, where the digital platforms that you use own the data. So all these digital platforms, obviously Facebook and all of these people own our data and they market our data as they wish. But Web3 is going to give us more autonomy, the notion of self-sovereign identity, which is how it's described by some of the you know, people who comment in this area. So we ourselves begin to control our own data. With Web3, each person online will have a unique identifier stored on a blockchain. You can then choose which applications to, uh, to uh, interact with by using a digital wallet. And this wallet becomes your identity. And of course, you can have multiple wallets all on you know, the same blockchain systems. The wallet then enables you to use various decentralized applications on the internet. And this is going to further disrupt financial and commercial transactions as we know it. So banks and other platforms that you are doing business with can read details of your accounts or see the digital assets that you own. So if you connect a wallet at a particular bank, it can, on the basis of your assets that it can see, do a wide range of credit and other banking business as you request. So since banks can see my assets that are held in blockchain, I don't need to open accounts in different banks from which I require credit. So, I mean, because I have all my information on blockchain, I have my wallet which identifies me. Three, four, five banks. Instead of opening accounts in three, four, five banks where I'm looking for credit, everybody has access to the information and they can make their credit decisions based on just, you know, the fact that I've connected using my unique identifier. So things are changing very, very rapidly. It's not going to be, it's certainly not going to be business as usual. Asset transfers will be simplified, credit judgments, and even debt restructuring can be done seamlessly. I owe bank A something, you know. Bank B knows that I owe bank A, but they want my business. But everybody can see the information at the same time. And they can, we can do all sorts of restructuring. We can do all sorts of arrangements because it's easier for everyone to do business. I don't have to go to each bank opening so long as I can, I can connect with you. I, we can all do business. So here we find yet another major opening for new and more efficient uh, digital financial systems and products. I think Web3 will also mean digi that digitization of government services will come with far more options than ever before. Government agencies can then be smarter, faster, and more efficient in delivering their services. One big area of business is the digitization of government processes and services. That's a big area. And there's a sleeping commercial giant. Of course, you hear a lot of talk about, yes, this is online, this ministry is online, that agency is online. But we're far from achieving actual digitization of government services. Because 
What that means is that we should be able to interact with all government websites and government services and processes using our mobile phones. It should be as straightforward, as simple, and as intuitive as that. There should be no obstacles between us and the services. So passports, applications for passports, for driver's licenses, all of those kinds of things. There must be an efficient, digitized way of doing it. Now, that is a whole new area of business. And I think that uh, it's, it's a, an area of business that some have already, of course, tapped into. Um, uh, Mr. Tubi was talking about uh, the Jeep, which is the BOI's, uh, uh, BOI's um, platform for, and I think they now have a platform called the Growth Platform, <clears throat> which is the platform used for trader money and market money and all of that. And um, Yomi is here, who was involved in this, in the, I think your company built the, the platforms. Is it, I mean, a local company many years ago, I, 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 Yomi is now looking more, is a much more prosperous fellow, you know, as you can see. But many years ago, his company built the platforms for trader money and market money. Now that is one aspect, just one aspect of government services. Local companies can do, there's just so much room to do so much work. And so this microcredit for uh, informal traders, which is a trader money, market money thing. Of course, uh, his company was able to build uh, that uh, platform at the time, but then there are so many other platforms that must be built, so many other services that must be completely digitized. So the whole range of government services will provide excellent opportunities for innovation. 3D as I'm sure everyone here on, uh, will agree, is a big part of Web3. It is the so fiber, if you like, of Metaverse. In a few short years, Metaverse would enable me to, to sit uh, and study virtually in the library of the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London, where I used to go and bring all these uh, photocopies for research back home. So it would be possible for me to virtually, you know, actually, you know, sit toward the library, see for myself, be immersed, as it were, in, 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 the, in, in that whole uh, library experience if I wished. So there are things that will happen that um, are just going to be completely astonishing in the way that they're going to transform the way we research for those of us who are interested in research, the way we do commerce, the way we do practically everything and the way we work. It's impossible today to imagine what Web3 will mean for education, for agriculture, for medicine, for industry. Just take education, for instance. There's a lot of talk now about, look, how are we going to improve science and technology? As a government, we're thinking in terms of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, uh, and maths, which are very, very important building blocks for the digital economy and for the future of our country. But then laboratories are in short supply. A lot of equipment and all of that is in short supply. But think what Metaverse will do. Think of what virtual reality can do, you know, for laboratories, for training medical personnel, for training scientists and all of that. You will not need to have the actual physical laboratories. So there's so much that can be done now, There's so much that will be done virtually, so much that can be, so education, even tertiary education, is not going to be the same. It's very, very unlikely that for a country this size, 200 million people, with a shared number of people going to universities every year, that we're going to be building brick and mortar universities in the next 10, 20 years. Impossible. It wouldn't even make sense. Already we're arguing about paying for the, you know, public universities or the public institutions, we're arguing about paying uh, lecturers, paying staff. Online universities, the new uh, the virtual universities of various kinds and the depth that Metaverse will give it is the new direction for education, for tertiary education. And whether we like it or not, or whether, you know, uh, traditional people like you and I, like me, for instance, not you, like it, that's the direction it's going to go. 
lecturers walking into into theaters and speaking to in crowded uh, lecture theaters is is going to be gone in a few years and people practically all over the world will be able to get into an immersive uh, experience in, in, in listening to lectures from practically anywhere in the world. So a whole new world is unfolding before our very eyes. Unlike web one and two, where we can relative, where we were relatively disadvantaged. And we're quite disadvantaged because in 1989, for example, we didn't have mobile phones. So we couldn't take advantage of the rich and depth that mobile telecoms gave digital innovation and uh, digital innovation, for example, financial inclusion. We didn't have the reach. In, I mean, in 1989, I, there was no way that even with Web 1 and, of course, the beginnings of, you know, of Web 2, we, we didn't have an, any, I mean, nobody could say that uh, you could even use the internet from your home because you didn't have any, you didn't have access. Very few people had uh, even the workstations at the time. Very few people even had. But now with mobile technology, we can, we can now do a lot more in Web3. We are much better positioned to be significant players in Web3. And we've already shown that we have the talent, we have the creativity, and we have the acumen to build and grow major tech companies. At the last count, I think we have about six unicorns, and there are so many on the way. But we must spend time on the development of digital skills. And that is so important. This digital skills gap is a serious business, a big deal. We must spend time doing that. And of course, it will come with government investment. But the government, public sector and private sector must sit down at meetings like this and elsewhere to try and think through these issues. We did that with, uh, with uh, changing the whole regime of banking licenses. We had uh, a sub uh, a subgroup of our industrial and competitiveness council, which was on technology. That subgroup had very about uh, five or so young men and women in technology, and we were able to think through how to license fintechs, which is where we have what we have today. It is, it's not it's not rocket science. Thinking of how to make progress, thinking of how to change policy thinking of how to make sure that policy is way ahead of developments. And these developments are taking place every day. It's, it just involves sitting down and thinking. And I think that that we absolutely need to do. We must develop appropriate policies, regulations that promote rather than inhibit innovation and commerce. We must look at how do we promote commerce? How do we promote the digital economy? Not how do we regulate it to a point where it's difficult to do business. We can, we can be world leaders in the Web3 revolution. The only limit is our vision. And I'm sure that all of us who are seated here are men and women of vision. This annual summit, uh, I must say, is a testimony to the joint commitment of the government and private sector to the rapid and value-driven development of Nigeria. And I must again commend the Foresight Group and the numerous local and foreign partners who have sustained this partnership by putting together this summit and driving conversations on how best to shift our country and its systems into the next phase of the digital uh, evolution. The outcomes of these past summits, the, and there have been two previous summits, have contributed positively to an improved policy environment and better governance in the areas of innovation and investments over the years. Amongst other things, uh, the summit has over the years helped to foster better understanding between the public and private sector on the realities and opportunities in Nigeria and uh, the realities and opportunities for the future. And I think that we must continue to work uh, uh, these summits and perhaps do a few more things in between summits, a few more uh, thinking, um, a few more thinking sessions, a few more thinking through innovation sessions. We shouldn't wait from one summit to the other. Groups, small groups can th think through so many, many issues and there's so much to do, so much to think about and so much information. So I'd like to again thank you all very much for making the time to attend this uh, event, but also 
because you are part of the future, the great, great future of our country in the digital space. Thank you very much. God bless you.